Hello, today we're going to be going over to Solar Air by Palomino. It's a 244 model. And we're going to be starting right up front here with our tongue jack. You're going to have two switches on the front here. One's going to be for the light, so if you had to hook up at night, you can see. And then the other one, so you're able to extend and retract the, uh, the hitch here, or the front, so you can level the camper from front to back. Do you like to recommend while you're still hooked to the tow vehicle? You want to make sure you're level from side to side first. You may have to put blocks on one side or the other. Uh, but we do like to recommend using a carpenter's level right inside the doorway when you go to figure out that measurement. But they also have stick-on levels that you can buy to figure that out as well. From there, you use your tow vehicle to roll onto them and then unhook from the tow vehicle once you are level from side to side. And then roll forward and level from front to back with this guy. After that, you're gonna lower your stabilizer jacks. They're located on each corner of the camper. And it is a three quarter socket. I tell you that because it's easier to put it on a drill to lower them. They do provide a manual crank if you feel like working out. Next, we're gonna have where our two 20 pound propane tanks are. You guys have both been filled minus what was used to test the propane system with. But then this guy here is gonna be your regulator. Basically, this guy here does tell you what size or what tank you're using. But it also tells you if you have propane flow or not. So like this now is reading red because there ain't no propane. I'll go to turn this guy on, give that just a second. And as you see, it flips over to green saying that we have propane flow. It is designed to where you can have both tanks on. But the thing with it is, is that it will kind of pull from both tanks. So when one tank's empty, usually they're both going to end up being empty. So I like to recommend having only one on at a time. So you know when one of the canisters is empty. When that happens, just turn off the one, turn the other one on, and just flip that guy to the other side. Then we're going to have our battery. It's a 24 series Deep Cycle Marine RV style battery. I'm going to kind of show you uh, up front here, but kind of show you as we go around the coach how these guys are going to kind of operate. This is going to be your front one here, basically, though. To unlock it, you would just lift this, and the arms would come out on both sides, and it will fold down. And I'll show you how we're going to fold that up here shortly uh, once we get to the back side. Over here is going to next is going to be the fresh water connection. So basically, it is gravity fed. You just stick the hose in and let it fill. Do read the monitor panel inside so that when the tank does refill, shut off the water. You don't want to let that guy just start overfilling. Over time, it can cause damage to both the inside and the outside where this guy is connected. Then down below that is where your city water hookup is going to be located. With this, it is always recommended that you have a pressure regulator on the water spigot. From there, your options of an inline water filter and then your blue or white water drinking hose. From there, you'll hook up. You better ready to start using the water on the cold side right away. You do have to wait for the water heater to fill before you have water coming from the hot side. Located right down here is going to be where your fresh water drain is located. Uh, and get it. We're going to go ahead and open that up. Got a little bit of water still in that guy. But then there's a white hose right over here. That's actually considered to be your breather tube for the fresh water. All right. All right, so you do have a uh, slide on this uh, unit as well. But this is a swim textile slide. One thing you have to note with these guys are these are to never be lubricated. Uh, basically, if they start looking dirty or dingy, they say the simple rec uh, recommendation for these guys is uh, clean with soap and water. So you got a galley tank underneath here. Basically, it's going to be the drain or your tank for just the kitchen sink. Your tires do have a tire monitoring system on the inside so they can monitor the tire pressure for you. You do always want to keep these guys topped off to their max PSI level. I believe these guys are 65 PSI. But then you also do want to make sure that you are torquing the lug nuts when you are supposed to. Uh, this sticker here recommends that you do it at 50, 100, and 200 miles. I always like to recommend when you usually leave the campground, uh, we're making all those turns to get out of there. Well, first place we stop is usually the gas station to refuel. While you're refueling, you can check out the lug nuts. You're knocking out two birds with one stone. Those are to be torqued to 100 foot-pounds. This guy here is going to be your black tank flush. Basically, this is a sprayer inside the black tank. Sprays around and gets your nastiness out. As you see, there is a caution sticker there. Basically, that is to tell you that you want to make sure that the valve is open when you go to start using this guy. 
But basically, you want to make sure you use a pressure regulator on the spigot as well. I like to say that because on the back side of this is a plastic check valve. Too strong a water pressure can damage that check valve. But then go out and get yourself a black hose. Black tank, black hose, it keeps it simple. Blue and white's for drinking, black is for the nastiness. Once you got your valve open, turn that guy on, you'll start flushing. You got an elbow that comes with your sewer hose. It does not come with the coach, it is an aftermarket purchase. But with that elbow, you're able to see when the water's coming out clear, you know, to shut off the spigot and unhook your hose from there first before unhooking from here. Then when you'll close off your valve and then pull your other gray to drain the bathroom sink and shower. Next, you got your 50 amp power cord, and this is where guy he's gonna hook up. They do provide you a little light here if you had to hook up at night. Uh, your campground cable or satellite. For the campground cable, you do have to turn off the TV antenna booster, and I'll show you how to do that once we have stepped inside. Uh, it is also prepped for solar. It just does not have panels on it. That is another aftermarket option. So when these guys are in their full right position, Basically, you got, we got the bars inside in here. Uh, this is how this guy is going to look. You do have an outside shower as well, right here. Options of hot and cold water. You're going to have your low point drains located right underneath here. Basically, red's for hot, blue is for cold. These are the lowest points of the water lines inside your coach. So basically, when you're done camping, uh, I always like to recommend opening up those, opening up one of your faucets as you guys drive home. That air is going to blow through and push any excess water out of there so you wouldn't have any water left in there. It becomes stagnant or bad. We do got our spare tire underneath there. We're getting ready to see that here a little better in just a second. So with this guy, I've already got this inside pretty much prepped and ready to be lifted and put away. To do so, basically all you're going to do is just push this guy up. You do have to tuck that guy in. You have to do that on both sides. Then this guy will wrap around and locks into place. And these guys do have locks on them, so you are able to lock them as well so they wouldn't potentially pop open going down the road. You do have a rear storage compartment as well where you got your manual crank handle. <clears throat> your bumper will hold that sewer hose, but it generally does not hold that elbow I was talking about. What you can do is get yourself a plastic container with uh, ice cream, and we can either have a good time eating it or a depressing time. It's entirely up to you and tiring on the circumstances. But save that plastic container when you're done and you can keep that elbow inside that uh, that container so it wouldn't be rolling around getting all the, anything nasty inside. I've also seen where customers would screw it down inside a compartment so then that way that container isn't sliding around either. Next, we're gonna have our little outside kitchen area station. It comes with a pan. And then this guy here will pull out. You lift this up and this will pull out here. Now this is a 110 connection and it is conductive. So you have to have this pan here before this thing will even acknowledge. So like right now our power button actually here is flashing. I don't know if you can see it. It might be a little hard to see, but from there we're able to turn it on and then you can set your temperature settings. But this guy will not work if this pan is not on there. I did have to put some water in it to make sure that it did work. So there's a little bit of residue on that guy from the water and uh, it works pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, you do have a warning here uh, about the outside cooking area as well. Uh, one thing that they do usually like to recommend and note, I'm pretty sure that's what this one here is. Yep, right here. Uh, basically when you're using this area, they recommend that your awning should be in. And then this here, can come out if you want it to, but it's just a nice little cutting board area. And then this guy here is 110 only, so you do have to be plugged in to sure power for this to have power as well. It does have a railing. Uh, 
for if you guys decide you wanted to get a uh, aftermarket barbecue grill. Pretty much that's what the railing is for. Then it has an LP quick disconnect to hook up for that. So next we got the water heater here. So with this guy, it is gas or electric option. For the electric option, it's gonna be located on the lower left corner down here. And right now it's in the off position because we don't have any water in it. For the gas option, it's gonna be a switch inside. But basically, you're always going to pull this guy out when you're done because you want to try to get all the water out of the coach. But as you see, it's already doing its job. It's attracting the uh, impurities in the water, so it's attacking the rod and not the tank. This guy starts out the size of a dime and works itself down to the size of a coat hanger. But this is your anno rod. All right, this is a 1 and 1 16 socket to, uh, to secure it in and to take it out. When you go to take it out, you do have to open this guy to relieve the pressure. Otherwise, you get a nice little shower. Or, yes, you'll get a nice little shower, and hopefully that water is not hot. Do have our outside speakers on, so you can hear those guys operating. Does have a mount for uh, for to bring a T or to set a TV up out here, and then you have your connection M110. This here is going to be the exhaust and intake for your furnace. So you try not to block this area, but we do like to recommend getting mud diver screens. Those guys are only about $15, uh, but these guys will help you if for some reason a wasp or mud dauber was to get in there. They can actually create issues to where you'd have to have it serviced and labor rates are at least $145 and up, if not $150 and up anymore. Um, the demand for service is getting up there, so they're able to try to you know, some shops are just really expensive. We'll come back and talk about the steps here in just a minute. Uh, as you see, I have our awning out at this time. Uh, basically, you're looking for this flap to be down vertical with the ground. But then you have two lights on each end of your arms. I'll show you how to turn those guys on and off here shortly. But you are able to right here, it even tells you, pull down to adjust the pitch. So you pull it down and it'll create a pitch on it. This is meant to be as a shade protectant. We do always recommend if the camper is going to be unattended that you should bring your awning in. You never know when a pop-up storm or sudden gust, strong gusts of wind can occur and that can cause damage to both the awning and the camper if you are not careful. All right, then we have this small little compartment over here. I do have the panel kind of removed at this time, uh, but basically that panel is actually blocking where you would winterize your coach. So right now it's set up to pull water from the fresh water tank. When you go to winterize, you're basically gonna turn this knob right here and it'll allow you to pull antifreeze from here. And then you'll turn the pump inside and then you winterize. You always start from the furthest and work your way to the closest. As long as you can get most of the water out of this coach, you should be able to winterize this guy with yeah, about two gallons of antifreeze. Then we got our battery disconnect here. Basically, right now it's in the on position because we're plugged in the sure power. Uh, whenever we are storing the camper, we're going to turn that to that off position. So that way, if anything was left on, it won't potentially drain the battery. And then you got your solar panel controller. Basically, this guy here would monitor the battery. Once the battery gets below a certain level, it allows the surge from a panel to come through to charge the batteries for you. Uh, and then once the batteries are full, it will shut it off. But at this time, like I said, there is no panels on this unit. So the, the reading that it's reading right now is because we are plugged in for sure power. Oh. All right, so back at the entry door, um, I don't have your keys on me at this time, but your entry door is going to be a purple key. And basically for the door handle, you would turn the key to the right and that's gonna lock the door handle. When you go to lock the deadbolt down here, you have to turn the key to the left, but you have to turn the key back straight up and down to pull the key out. If you turn the key to the right and you're easily able to pull it out, that shows you you did not lock your deadbolt. All right, we are going to see. All right, so I am going to have to bring the awning in real quick before I can show you your steps here. When you go to bring the awning in, the door does have to be horizontal because it does block the arm on that side. 
Uh, so when you're bringing it in or out, make sure the door is vertical there. As you see, these guys are not the fastest guys in the world. steps you do have to make sure this door is opened up as much as possible and the reason for that is because if it's not this guy here can catch the door and cause damage but basically your door secures in just like so these guys here so you're able to adjust your feet and the reason for that is because you're going to want this here as flat with the threshold as possible too much of an elevation on this can cause issues to both the screen door and the entry door if you are not careful. Now, as you see, our feet ain't touching, so bring them out just a couple. Just like so. Got the screen door to release the screen door. Trap so no bugs can get in. This here so you can lock your deadbolt from the inside. There is no lock for the door handle itself on the inside. All right, as we step inside the coach, you're gonna have your fire extinguisher located right here at the entry door. And then you're gonna have your control panel. Basically, you got your battery status, your fresh tank, black and gray, and then gray two. I believe gray two was the kitchen sink, but please don't quote me on that. There's your switch to bring your on and in and out. The water pump, you're only using the water pump if you're using the fresh water tank. If you're hooked to city water, you do not need that guy. Then you got the gas option for the water heater. Living room lights. Awning lights. And then to bring your slide room in or out. And we'll show you that when we get done uh, going around the coach. Because the, it works on two independent motors that basically communicate with each other. So I want you to at least try to hear those sounds so you know what you're listening for. All right, so next we're going to come this way over here. You got your here, switch here. Basically, it raises and lowers the TV. And you got USB hookup. So for the TV, whenever you guys get to new new area, if you're not close to the St. Louis area, you will have to rescan for channels. Basically, to do so, you're just going to push the button there with the three lines. It'll pull up your menu. You're going to go all the way to the end to settings. Go down to channel, channel sources, and then from there you can change. You go up to new, and you would choose either cable or antenna, and then you're going to hit the OK again, where it's light up right here, and it's going to scan for channels. Oh, I did tell you that incorrectly. I'm sorry. Whenever you guys are going to choose the campground cable, you have to change the channel installation mode to cable. My apologies. It's getting at that time of the day. Channel 5 doesn't like the work for us as well. But I do believe it picked up uh, 30, 38 channels, I believe is what it was, inside our building. Uh, usually if you got a good enough open area, you can pick up usually anywhere between 43 to 46 channels. Uh, so down here is where our TV antenna booster is going to be located. So basically there's a button right here that you would push and it disconnects that cable feed. Or that, I'm sorry, it disconnects the antenna. The antenna is considered the primary source. You have to shut that source off for the cable signal to come through. This remote here is going to be for your radio slash CD DVD player. This guy does not play Blu-rays, but will play DVDs. So we had our outside speakers on. That's going to be speaker zone A. Speaker zone B is your inside speakers. You can't have them both on at the same time if you want. I do always like to recommend if you are watching a movie to make sure you turn off the outside speakers. So that way the people outside ain't listening to the movie with you. As you see, we've already kind of got this bed uh, in the up position. Uh, 
So with our sofa, this mattress does not generally fit in here like it's supposed to. Okay, but that's what the straps are for. Um, and I'll show you a little more about the mattress when we go back there a little bit. But this is basically how you're going to end up securing this guy. Is you're going to have it flipped inward, and then this piece here would hang out while the other side is stuffed inside. Then we got our couch area here. You are actually able to pull this guy out and move it around if you want. And there's also storage underneath. You do have also storage underneath each bench seat. And I believe our back one also is also a storage area as well. So inside here is going to be most of the manuals for the appliances inside the coach. Uh, for the uh, unit itself, it's going to be an app you would download. And that sticker is actually left right here on the microwave, so you guys are able to do that. And it's also a 24-7 emergency roadside assistance as well. But inside here, this is probably going to be one of the most important papers in your entire manual. And this is an appliance info sheet. So basically, if something was a breakdown, they may ask you what the model number and the serial number to that item is. Nice thing is, is on this paper, it's all listed for you, so it makes it a lot easier. Also, what I have in this guy... Are going to be these guys right here and i'm going to show you that in just a minute there is also a little cute little tong spatula for your outside stove area and that should be about the end All right. so then you also like i was saying have a tire monitoring system and that's going to be this guy right here just by turning this guy on uh, it might read, not read nothing for a minute because it's got to go around and sense it and do all its thing and then it will pop up here and let you know what's going on. And then inside here is going to be a couple of different options for mounting. So if you have this guy in, inside or you can set this on inside on your thing and it will just sit there like so. Uh, or it gets mounted to, oh, it gets mounted to your uh, windshield and then you got your charger hooked up for that. It's a USB, so if you wanted to bring it inside to charge it, you can do so. So I'm not sitting here putting it together. So it's reading that one tire, slowly making its way around. All right, so we're going to carry this guy with me just for two seconds here. We're going to turn around and just dump him right there real quick. So then next we're going to have our fridge. So our fridge is a 12 volt style fridge, but basically you just turn the knob here for what you want. Please note that these guys do take yelling at me. So one thing to note with these guys is since they are 12 volt, they can drain your battery if you're not plugged into sure power. Another thing is, is that most RV style fridges do take 12 to 24 hours to properly get the temperature. So please be mindful of that. You can't be trying to shove food in there right away and expect it to be cold. Okay? Alright. So next, as you see here, I actually did leave this one up, open so I can kind of show you guys from the inside what you would have to do. But this guy here is actually designed because this is a heated mattress. So you would plug this guy in and you can just set your temperature to or your setting on it. Um, I have noticed a lot of times that if you just try to turn it on and wait for it to get hot and you go to put your hand on it, it's going to feel cool. You actually have to have, it has to have like some kind of weight on it or a blanket on it to help try to trap some of that heat in there and wait. Um, I have noticed like when I try to test these, I would lay down on them uh, after it's been on for an hour and I would put my hand on it and it's it doesn't feel hot at all but i would lay down and i could feel it warming up within a few moments i'm gonna set that guy right here so each uh tent area also comes with one of these fancy dancy little fan slash lights so you got your light side over here 
And then the fan actually has two different settings. You got one for low or two for high. And your power is just right there. But this is designed to where, as you see, you can either hang like that or it can hang just like so. Turn that guy on, get your nice little reader light at night. Like I said, these guys, there's one for every tent area, so there's actually three of them. This, this guy here, what looks like an extra, like, ambiance curtain, uh, looks like they actually built this for a bag so you can disassemble the poles and store the poles in the bag if you like. Here's how the mattress should look once it has properly been in place. And I'm about to show you guys that one on here. So you got your straps here. We're going to pull these guys out. This bed will come forward like so. Then you're going to pull this guy here and then start to pull this forward. You usually have to kind of help hold that fabric up so it won't get too damaged. This guy here will come out. I know we just set that guy there. But once again, they got that bag for the poles. So as you see, that one piece is sitting partially on your mattress. And then from there, you would flip it. You would go outside and raise it up to fold in. I'm going to put these straps here so this mattress doesn't continue to keep trying to fall. And this one here does not have a strap. Now I'm going to show you a nice little cheat secret here in just a minute about getting these tents put, put up. And it's actually a nice little feature. Uh, you do have a hookup right here for a TV and a 110, another USB. Uh, and you also have a TV and hookup on this back wall as well for someone back here in this tent area. You got storage underneath. Uh, you got your vents down here on the bottom. Those guys are going to be for your furnace. The vents on the ceiling are for your air conditioner. All right, as we step into the bathroom area, we're gonna have our toilet. So with the toilet, you would lightly press on the pedestal to add water so you can do your business. All the way down is gonna flush. You do always wanna to try to keep some water in the bowl of this toilet so that that seal doesn't get dry rotted or brittle. Uh, but you also take nonstick cook spray, spray the bowl of that toilet, helps everything slide down, makes an easier clean for the cleaner. You also have to make sure you put a chemical in the toilet before you start using it. There is either liquids or pouches. If you use the liquid, generally you just hold this down and you go one, two. Um, generally two ounces treats a 40 gallon tank. I don't know if the tank on that is on this is that large. But uh, from there you'd be ready to go. If you're using the pouch, I always recommend filling the bowl with some water, usually about yay, like right there or so, and then put that pouch in. Make sure that pouch dissolves. I have seen some where some of them pouches have not dissolved. Then we got our shower area here. This is, you have to make sure that this is secure during travel or the glass can get shattered. And then basically you're gonna have your shower, hot and cold water, and then you got this reducer button on it. Basically it reduces the flow of water. <clears throat> the reason for that is because your water heater is only six gallons and the average American uses 38 gallons of just hot water when they take a shower. So you just outmatch out the gate. That button there is to help you try to get the most out of your hot water. Then we got our medicine cabinet. Inside there you got your hookups for a towel rack and toilet paper holder. And then your cap, your plugs for the sink and shower. I don't know why you would need a plug for the shower, but you got one. GFCI protected outlet up here. And then you do have storage down below. I believe. All right, so now here's the nice little fancy feature I'm gonna show you guys here. So, whenever you guys are gonna be bringing your tents in, as long as you have all the windows closed, the air conditioner ain't running, things like that, what you do is you open this guy right here. You would open this up turn it on and you're going to set it to the highest speed which is four which I 
think that's what I got it on. There we go. Now what you would do is you would go outside, you shut your entry door, and what it does is it helps sucks the canvases in when you go to raise them up. So it kind of helps you a little bit so you ain't having to try to sit there and fight. Go to one side, try to tuck the fabric in. Go to the other side, tuck it in, bring it in more. Then you got to do the same thing. The fan will actually help you, okay? So let the camper help you bring these guys in, okay? I did it for so long, for years, I would work on campers and I kept fighting these things. And one day another tech showed me that and I tell you what, it is one of the nicest things ever. It's a cheat your way to victory kind of thing. Especially if you're using the one up front because you got to try to walk around the A-frame while you're trying to push that sucker up. It can get tricky. So next we're going to have our thermostats for the air conditioner and furnace. As you see, you do have two thermostats here. This They've already prepped it for a second air conditioner, although there is not one on the unit. Uh, basically, it would take place in front of your skylight, or I'm sorry, your vent. I'm going to di direct my camera lady right here. It would replace this guy right here, and that's because it tells us even right here that this is where our air conditioning circuit is located, so there's wiring already in here. It's all tied into that thermostat. It's tied into a 110 on a breaker. Uh, so you would just have to install a second air conditioner. But basically you got your modes. You would have off, just the fan, your air conditioner, and then your furnace. 85 is as high as it will go. And it just kicked on, but we ain't got a lot of propane in the system, so it, it's not gonna run for a minute. And like I said, this guy here ain't gonna do nothing because it's not connected to it's not connected to a second air conditioner. Then you got cabinet space up here and below. You would remove this panel right here, and behind here is gonna be where the back of your water heater is. It's gonna be two white valves, like I showed you for your winterization up front. You'll turn both of those valves so the antifreeze does not go into the water tank. Uh, if you're if you use more than two gallons of antifreeze, you probably didn't close those off and that antifreeze is going into your water heater. We don't want to do that. Next, we got the microwave. It's pretty self-explanatory. Do you like to say set the time and you guys go out, enjoy your day, you come back, well, you see the time ain't set. You might want to look and see if that was from the electric company or from the campground, especially if you're at a campground that has a, a, you know, a massive number of campers there, uh, especially during the summertime. All them air conditioners going at one time, you're liable to experience power surges. Uh, so I would like to always recommend get you a surge protector to hook up onto your unit, okay? That way it can try to help protect the camper from anything potentially happening. Then we got our stove here. This back piece here actually will hold two knives. It's a little slotcher for. But do be careful putting your knives in there because on the back side of this is an LP gas line that goes to your stove. So please be mindful of that. Sometimes they don't think everything through. And through. Uh, you do got your light, your fan for your hood range. Just started to come on and I don't know if you could hear it or not because of the furnace. Sounds like it takes a minute to actually get going. But then basically with your stove, you would turn this guy to high. And this here's your spark igniter. Like I said, it's probably not going to light for me because the furnace probably took all the propane that I lit into the system out. But basically, the spark igniter is for your three top burners and for your oven. When you're going to do the oven, you turn it to the flame icon. You push and hold it in while you spark ignite this. And generally, if you usually angle this just right, you can usually catch the spark off this glass. And you can see where that flame is lit. And then this guy here is just a light, little, kind of a little pretty ambiance light. And it's also the light for the oven. Down below there is going to be where our LP slash carbon monoxide detector is located. This guy is recommended you test this every 7 to 14 days. And to do so, you just simply push this button right here. And as you see, we're already performing a test. And that's all there was for that test. Nice and simple. Um, I... These guys usually have a life expectancy of about 7 to 10 years, roughly. I have seen them go out before that. Uh, the nice thing about this model, though, it does actually have your replace-by um, 
on the front instead of on the back. Some of these guys, you'd actually have to remove it to see the when the, the replace date is on those. That's nice to actually put that on the front. I do like those models. Right next to that's going to be where our, <clears throat> excuse me, our fuse control panel box is located. So basically everything that runs and operates off the battery is going to be on these fuses. And they do have it all labeled right here for you as well. Everything that runs off sure power, so you have to be plugged in for it to work, is going to be on your breakers. Okay, and this right here is actually considered your GFCI. So if for some reason your outlets ain't working, they have the GFCI sticker, come and check, make sure this guy hasn't been tripped. Just like I can push this right here. We just performed a test on it to make sure that it's properly working. But you got to turn it all the way off, then turn it back on. And that green light in there always flashes. Just so you know. This guy here, you would turn on by hand. And you've got storage up above as well. It is pre-wired for Wi-Fi also. All the wiring is behind that panel. And then you got storage down below. Another drawer. These guys here are designed to where you can pull your tabletop. You twist your legs out. They sit on the floor and these caps will go in there. You can actually turn your bed, uh, this table into a bed. Uh, it sits right on here. And then these cushions fill in the space. And then from there, we have made our way back to the doorway. Before we end this video, we are going to bring this slide in so you guys can hear the way that those motors sound. Oh, real quick, let me come out of here. It's just that. It's just that light there. Now, as you hear, those guys do make a whine sound. And when it comes all the way in, you want to continue to hold the slide room button for three to five seconds. The reason for that is because, like I said, they there are two independent motors that talk to each other. So one motor might be moving a couple resolutions faster than the other. So by holding that button, when you're bringing it in or out, is that it helps synchronizes the room once they're all the way in is it'll suck the other side in if it wasn't on the same resolutions as the other side uh there is no bringing this out halfway it's either all the way in or all the way out all right from there thank you for your time hopefully this video was knowledgeable and informational for you and if you guys do have questions please feel free to call us and we do our best to answer those for you over the phone thank you and have a wonderful day